Thank you, Gerd, and uh, thank you very much for this invitation. I'm really excited to share some of my research with you. So my research is on the field of catalysis, which is uh, central to the chemical industry, uh, being important in uh, several processes, ranging from chemicals manufacturing to energy generation, food production, etc. So as a big as a motivator, I have some numbers here. For instance, out of all chemical synthesis processes, catalytic are 85 to 9 percent of them, and out of these. 80 to 85 percent happen on solid catalysts. These are the materials that I'm, I'm studying. So it's about 70 percent of all chemical synthesis processes involve heterogeneous catalysts. Then it's estimated that the economic impact of catalytic process is about 30 to 40 percent of the global GDP. We're talking about staggering numbers. And here I have a little diagram that shows the value of the catalyst market in billion dollars. And you see that it's uh, increasing. It's projected to reach 48 billion dollars. In, uh, in a few years, right? Four years from now. In addition to that, catalysis has been uh, quite important and it's attracting a lot of attention uh, in terms of, um, in the context of sustainability. So processes like converting captured CO2 into methane or methanol, uh, these things can be used, for instance, as fuels or downstream other chemical processes or converting biomass to fuels and chemicals. Again, these processes uh, need catalytic materials in order to happen. However important catalytic materials are, they're quite non-trivial to, to discover, and it's also non-trivial to develop catalytic technologies and reactors. We're talking about a multi-scale problem with several layers and levels of complexity, all the way from the electron and atom to the reactor. So we're talking about several orders of magnitude uh, in terms of the spatial scales from angstrom to meter, and also temporal scales from picoseconds up to several hours when we're talking about the operation of reactors. Now, in the smaller scales, we are interested in uh, the chemistry on the catalytically active phase, which may be some transition metal supported on some uh, metal oxide. And in the higher scales, we care about chemistry and mass transport, right? So we really need to optimize the transport as well, especially we're talking, when we're talking about the mesh and macro scale in the reactor. So as a brief mention, we have a project um, that I'm involved in. It's a, a European Commission funded project, ReactsPro, which looks at bridging descriptions over all these scales and creating some workflows that allow you uh, to come up with models um, of uh, the reactor, right? The chemical uh, process, incorporating quite a lot of uh, high fidelity simulations at the micro scales. So, we're talking about complex multi-scale phenomena, which are challenging to understand and control. But even if we focus on the catalytic nanoparticle facet scale, which is what this talk is going to be about, we also have quite a lot of complexity at that level. So here I summarize a few key uh, concepts and sources of complexity for these catalytic uh, materials. So let's look at, first of all, um, the, uh, in terms of the reactions, uh, the reaction pathways that can happen. What I'm showing here is the transition state for methane coupling on palladium gold. You may think it's quite a simple surface. It's a flat surface, right? Flat uh, gold with one atom of palladium here. This is a single atom alloy geometry. But uh, this uh, coupling reaction has to be thought of as just one elementary event out of a sequence of several other reactions that may happen, complete pathways from methane all the way to right, the hydrogenated, all the way to carbon and four hydrogens. We have several intermediates here. Here is the reaction that I'm showing the transition state of, two methyls coupling uh, to give me ethane. And then you may have other species that can couple. So two methylenes can uh, couple to give ethylene, or a methyl and a methylene can couple to give ethyl uh, radical on the surface, etc. So we can have multiple elementary events and we can have intricate reaction patterns in the sense that these adsorbates on the surface may exist on different active sites at the initial state versus the product at the final state. We may have different site types. You notice the palladium here and the gold. So this means that possibly all of these reactions could happen on the uh, uh, gold sites or on the palladium sites. So you have a bit of a proliferation, right? So the multiple types of active sites mean that this reaction network proliferates in complexity because these reactions can happen at different site types. Imagine also that some of these might be low coordinated sites if we're looking into high index surfaces, so we can have step edges, corners, etc. 
In addition to that, the reactions that happen on catalytic surfaces are actually happening in the condensed phase. We have adsorbate layers that may be quite, uh, that may result to quite crowded surfaces. So as an example here, I have two methyl uh, groups that may happen to sit on gold next to our transition state. And because of the lateral interactions that these may exert, we may possibly destabilize the transition state or the initial state as well, if these interactions are repulsive. Um, in addition to that, because of these interactions, we may have ordering of the add layers. So we have complexity due to the presence of these lateral interactions, and these can actually have a, a significant influence on the reaction rates. Finally, to make things even more complicated, we may have dynamic catalyst reconstruction. So the nice surface that I show here may not be the same as I show it here in actual reaction conditions. You may have this palladium dimerizing with another palladium and creating a dimer or going into the bulk, or you may have roughening of the surfaces, etc. So these can happen under uh, reaction conditions. So the active sites may change in time, and this can even uh, lead to nonlinear effects and things like pattern formation. And I'm referring to some uh, famous um, results by Ertl and co-workers in which they have shown that pattern formation can result, right? So you have wave patterns on the surface. We're going to talk, to talk about these later. Uh, and these can result due to catalyst reconstruction. So in the remaining parts, in, in the remaining uh, parts of the talk, we're going to first focus on a kinetic Monte Carlo method development uh, um, effort that has been going on in my lab for the past uh, decade, which um, actually aims at developing uh, methods that allow us to integrate these sources of complexity into a computational framework that allows us to understand catalytic phenomena. Next, we're going to talk about uh, some applications-driven studies. So these are going to be on single atom alloys and highly dilute alloys that we've done quite a lot of work on. Uh, the first example is going to be on CC coupling on palladium gold and nickel gold single atom alloys. And the second example is going to be on surface aggregation effects going beyond single atom alloys to highly dilute alloys with dimers, trimers, etc. And we're going to try to predict the ensemble of active sites on uh, several materials. Finally, I'm going to briefly introduce some ideas and ongoing work for simulating larger scales and getting hopefully to a stage that we can incorporate the last source of complexity, dynamic catalyst reconstruction, and try to uh, create detailed models of uh, effects like these, pattern formations, spirals, et cetera. And finally, we're going to end up uh, with uh, some conclusions and a summary. So let's start with uh, the kinetic Monte Carlo method development. So for those of you who might not be familiar with kinetic Monte Carlo, I just have some slides that introduce the method. Um, the idea basically behind kinetic Monte Carlo is to coarse grain the time scale so that uh, we do some sort of accelerated molecular dynamics, if you wish. It's not really molecular dynamics, but it focuses on the time scale of the rare events. So if you were to actually do molecular dynamics for even some simple um, reaction like this, so we have CO in the gas phase and hydroxyl on the surface and they can combine and give us carboxyl. Um, if you were to think about what is going on in the molecular dynamics simulation, you're actually simulating trajectories on a potential energy surface. So the minima here correspond to the reactants and products, and then these are separated by some sort of uh, a barrier, right? So here's a transition state, a subtle point here. So if we were to do a molecular dynamics simulation, we would see something like this, a random wandering about the reactants region to the point that we overcome the barrier and go into the product field. The problem with this, done with molecular dynamics, is that it would take a long, long time to see such a transition. The transitions are rare events simply because the, um, the barriers to overcome are typically quite high. So most of the time in your molecular dynamics simulation would be essentially devoted to um, simulating these vibrations up to the point that you are lucky enough, you get enough energy through thermal fluctuations to go over the barrier. So instead of doing that, Kinetic Monte Carlo focuses on the rare events. It focuses on the time scale of the reactions. It doesn't care about how you actually got, you know, the precise vibrations that got you to the transition state and beyond. It um, uh, coarse grains this and uses um, the ideas from probability theory, essentially to simulate the sequence 
of uh, random events that correspond to reactants transitioning into protons. So the frequency, right, the probability per unit time, essentially, that these events are going to happen can be calculated through uh, transition state theory. And this is the formula that we use. So this K reaction is the uh, rate constant of the reaction, giving us the probability per unit time that the reactive event is going to happen. And this can be calculated like this. So all of these terms, we have these quasi partition functions, the delta energy, right, from the reactants to the transition state. So this is the activation energy of the reaction. So these can come from uh, lower level theories. In particular, we use density functional theory of initial calculations to parameterize this case. And then we can simulate a sequence of events, absorptions, desorptions, diffusions, and reactions on the surface. And from sampling, by sampling these trajectories, we can calculate catalytic performance metrics like activity, selectivity, yield, propensity of poisoning of the catalyst, as well as more advanced things like the structure of the add layer at a typical uh, reaction condition, et cetera. So this is quite nice. It simulates, right, the kinetic Monte Carlo method that allows us to therefore simulate reactions much faster than molecular dynamics. And at the same time, we keep the spatial information because these reactions are happening on a lattice, on a surface. Uh, contrary to microkinetic models, and I'm mentioning this briefly because this is another popular approach in uh, catalysis, computational catalysis, but for microkinetic models, we only care about the coverage, which doesn't really tell us anything about absorbent ordering, and it's somehow it's somewhat difficult to incorporate lateral interactions, going back to the complexities I mentioned, uh, with these types of models. So um, the kinetic Monte Carlo method um, well, it was, uh, I guess, invented quite a long time ago. But um, the, at the time when I started doing my, my postdoc, I thought that the current frameworks at the time were quite limited. So they were limited in reactions that would uh, operate or would happen between two adsorbates uh, on two sides. There was no uh, overarching kind of uh, approach that would deal with the complexity that we typically have. And actually this project, this graph theoretical kinetic Monte Carlo approach uh, was motivated by me being asked to simulate the water gas shift reaction on stepped platinum surfaces. So when I saw the DFT results that the fellow postdoc had uh, developed, had uh, calculated, I said, well, there's no way we can do this with traditional kinetic Monte Carlo. We need something more elaborate. So this is what gave rise to the idea of this graph theoretical kinetic Monte Carlo in which the lattice, is represented as a graph, right? So we have connected sides here, like this, which allows us with, to, to have quite a lot of uh, freedom in what types of sites we can have, what types of connectivity we can have, etc. So here you see a, a lattice, which is basically from a cubic tahedral particle that has been opened up and embedded into the plane. Uh, so we take into account explicitly the 111 facets, 100, the edges and corner sites, right? All of these site types can be explicitly captured in the simulation. The state of the kinetic Monte Carlo simulation um, is uh, essentially a set of numbers that tells us what exists on what, which site and with what orientation. So we take into account uh, different species and the dentates. If we have multi dentate species like this, right, the bulk type dentate in this case, and this is this, um, this pair of lattice sites. And then reactions can be represented as graphs again with a certain initial state and a certain final state. So here is one reaction, C oxidation, right? So oxygen is sitting on this uh, uh, circular site, let's say. This might be the top site, this might be the bridge site. Um, for CO, and then finally we get the bidentic CO. This is just a fictitious example of it. So when we have, uh, so during the kinetic Monte Carlo simulation, when we have information about uh, which adsorbate is sitting on which side, we solve a so-called subgraph isomorphism problem to identify the possible patterns, right? So in this case, here is our oxygen, these are the CO. So we have four possibilities of reactions that can happen in the next kinetic Monte Carlo step. And then uh, using um, random numbers, we can select one of these, right? So in this case, this was selected. So we advance the kinetic Monte Carlo step and the time, and then we continue with the simulation of next steps. So out of the sequence of uh, elementary reactions we simulate, we can get uh, statistics for the catalytic performance metrics that we, we are interested in. Now, I mentioned something about uh, lateral interactions. 
And there is a question of how we model these in the kinetic Monte Carlo. So just a little bit of a background uh, on that. Because of the adsorbates exerting these attractive or repulsive interactions, it turns out that the uh, energy of the add layer is not necessarily a sum of the adsorption energies or formation energies of the species on the surface. So if we have lateral interactions like pairwise interactions with the simplest case, for this uh, simple lattice, the total energy would be equal to four times the uh, absorption energy of this species plus twice the, the, the contribution, right, due to this pairwise interaction. So we have one pair, another pair here, and then we have the second nearest neighbor pair. This is this pair over here, etc. We may even have um, non-pairwise contributions. For instance, this triplet here could contribute its own energy to the add layer. So we're talking about multi-body effects. And in the most general uh, uh, representation, we can represent the energy of our lattice as a sum over all the possible patterns that contribute some uh, energy to the add layer. And what are we summing? We sum something like this. So these are the effective cluster interactions. This is the contribution to the energy uh, due to that pattern divided by this graph multiplicity, which essentially just takes care of overcounting due to symmetry, times the number of instances of the uh, interactions pattern. So this is a function of the lattice state. So we detect how many instances we have for the single body pattern, the two body patterns, etc. We sum everything up and we have our total energy. Now to find the effective cluster interactions, again, we can do DFT calculations for different configurations and we can fit these parameters so that we can come up with a so-called cluster expansion uh, for um, our model that gives us the energy of any absorbent layer. So if we have the cluster expansion, then going to uh, uh, simulate reactions becomes a bit easier because I can calculate the initial energy of the reaction, the final energy of the reaction um, as a function of coverage. So all of this is to take into account coverage effects. And then, um, of course, these patterns are also represented as graphs and they can be detected using this sub subgraph isomorphism problem. So if I, if I have the initial and the final state of the reaction, then I can also calculate the uh, energy of activation. Um, and the energy of activation will be also a function of uh, coverage and um, subject to this coverage effect. So just to give you a simple example of how attractive or repulsive interactions can affect the activation energy and therefore the rate, I have a, um, a case here where we're talking about desorption of this uh, species here. So this is sitting on a lattice site here and it's surrounded by four other sites, which in this configuration, they're just empty. So this can happen with a certain rate, a certain activation energy. And it's intuitive to think that if we start crowding the surface and if the lateral interactions are repulsive, then the rate is probably going to increase, right? The activation energy for this guy to go to the gas phase is probably going to be lower than the activation energy of that because this is subject to the repulsive interaction from the entity sitting on site number one. If we start putting more, right? We have repulsion between the, uh, the absorbate at site I and the absorbates at one and two. So even more repulsions, even higher propensity for this to go to the uh, gas phase. So every time I add something, right, under the assumptions of this pairwise additive model, the activation energy becomes smaller by a factor which is equal to this J interaction, right, the interaction energy. So uh, in this case, that's a simple example where I show that the rate increases uh, for repulsive interactions. But then if we want to treat the general case, we have to introduce some correlation between the activation energy uh, of the reaction and the delta energy of the reaction. So this can be done using bronsted demos polanyi relations. These are in linear relations that um, relate the activation energy with the delta energy of reaction. Again, um, just as an example here, if we have some um, uh, energy profile, right, energy with respect to the reaction coordinate, this is the initial state. Imagine something on the surface like the CO oxidation reaction, CO plus oxygen. And the final state would be CO2 in the gas phase that would not interact with the surface. 
If I start crowding the surface, I'm going to destabilize the initial state and I'm going to destabilize potentially the transition state by a little bit. So here is how my profile would look like now. Right? So I destabilize the initial state, the transition state as well. Here is the new interaction energy in the presence of uh, lateral interactions. This is the original one with the blue um, at the zero coverage limit. And here are the delta energies of reaction, right? The blue at the zero coverage limit, the red with finite coverages. So we have these linear correlations on the right that show us how the uh, activation energy is related to the uh, activation energy at the zero coverage limit and the delta energies of reaction at the zero coverage limit and the finite coverage limit. There is also this omega factor, which is called the proximity factor, which is essentially the slope of that and tells us how close the transition state is to the reactants or the products. So omega equals zero means transition state, which is initial state light. Omega equals one is the other extreme. Our transition state is final state light. So if I write these equations for the forward and the reverse, um, then um, these are done in a consistent way, microscopically consistent, right? So uh, adhering to this micro reversibility requirement so that the delta energy of reaction at the finite coverage is equal to the activation energy forward minus activation energy reverse, both of them evaluated at the finite coverage. So this delta energy of reaction comes from the cluster expansion, and then using these, I can calculate the activation energies at the finite uh, coverages. So with this uh, sort of framework, I can capture the effect of local reaction environment on the activation energy and therefore the rate of the elementary events. So that's, uh, uh, this is pretty much the, uh, the set of components that we have introduced in the uh, graph theoretical kinetic Monte Carlo. And there is a software implementation of that. Uh, Zacros is the software that we've been working on uh, since I started at UCL 10 years ago, 11 years ago by now. Um, see, here are some, just some papers that uh, you might be interested in. These have introduced quite a lot of algorithmic improvements and uh, methods that make the computations uh, efficient. You can find everything on the website, right? Zacros.org. Um, and of course, if you're interested, I'm also happy to give you more details on that. Here is some typical kinetic Monte Carlo output for a very simple reaction here so that I can just put everything on one slide. The uh, CO oxidation reaction is the one that I'm showing here. So we can calculate coverages of species, right? Carbon monoxide and oxygen. We can also visualize the configurations of the adsorbates on the lattice. This is a very simple model in this case. So we don't have any correlations or anything, but I, uh, we have done research on other systems in which you actually do have some long range ordering. You can also calculate turnover frequencies uh, just by counting how many molecules of your product are uh, produced. So from this law, you can get the turnover frequency per site, and you can also uh, do this uh, pathway analysis to find the event frequency per site for any of the elementary events that you're interested in. So this is my uh, kind of introduction to Kinetic Monte Carlo and summary of what we've been doing and how the graph theoretical method works. And now let's move on to talk about what we can do with it. So I'm going to first discuss this example in which we're going to travel to, to try to unravel the complexity in the CC coupling on these two single atom alloys, palladium gold and nickel gold. So just as a brief introduction to the single atom alloys, um, I wanted to kind of highlight what is uh, nice about them and why we, we care. So single atom alloys are alloys in which one component is doped into a secondary metal component at such high dilutions that it, it remains atomically dispersed. So here is palladium surrounded by copper. And if you were to look into the so-called linear scaling relationships, which are relationships in catalysis that correlate transition state energies with uh, dissociation energies, like the bronze devons polanyi relation, for instance, you would see that um, there is, a, there is a linear correlation between the two. And the two components here lie in opposite sides of the spectrum for a certain reaction. So my reaction of, uh, uh, as an example here, I have this hydrogen dissociation. If you do it on copper, you have a high transition state, so high barrier, but also 
hydrogen doesn't bind very strongly on copper, so you have a not very negative dissociation energy, right? The dissociation energy is the delta energy of reaction. Now, if you were to do this reaction on palladium, you would see that palladium very easily splits hydrogen, but hydrogen binds very strongly on that surface as well, right? So this would be palladium 111, a nice flat surface, bulk palladium. So this is the point that corresponds to palladium in my linear scaling relationship. Now, by alloying palladium at a high dilution, right, at the single atom limit, right, we're operating at this ultimate limit of efficiency, um, uh, alloying this into copper, I have created some special types of sites at the interface between palladium and copper. And at the same time, I may also be, uh, be benefited, I, I benefit from the fact that I have many more copper sites than palladium. So thinking of uh, uh, entropy, these uh, hydrogen atoms you tend to spill over to the copper phase, just driven by entropy, by the sheer number of uh, uh, copper sites compared to the palladium sites. So this means that I have created a catalyst which in which hydrogen gets activated on the palladium sites, and then the hydrogen can spill onto the copper, right? And tropically driven spillover. So I have the best of both worlds, facile activation, weak binding. I have escaped this linear scaling relationship. I have a new material that uh, doesn't adhere to this. So it overcomes any limitations that come with this uh, linear scaling. So I have activity better than expected. And at the same time, these hydrogens that have now spilled over onto copper can participate into hydrogenation reactions on copper. And because I don't have very strong binding of these on, on copper, these reactions are happening with high selectivity, All right? So I benefit from the high selectivity due to this bifunctionality of the catalyst, splitting of hydrogen on this side, hydrogenation reactions on the copper side in a selective fashion. So this is just one example, and we have worked quite a lot uh, on these systems. These are um, uh, cover pages from two review articles that um, you can consult if you, need, if you want to know more about that. So today I'm going to talk about uh, methyl coupling on palladium gold, motivated by the need to valorize methane, essentially. So methane is a greenhouse gas a pollutant that uh, is uh, usually flared during petroleum operations. So it would be nice to try to do something about it. So if you uh, split one hydrogen or more, you could potentially have uh, groups like methyls, methylenes, et cetera, that come together and you can build more uh, higher hydrocarbons, right? Hydrocarbons with uh, higher molecular weight. So we have done some work previously on platinum copper in which we have seen that CC coupling is mediated by uh, CH2, right? Methylene or CH coupling. But uh, we also wanted to look into methyl coupling because it's uh, quite interesting and much more challenging than uh, coupling of methylenes. So it turns out that most of the single atom alloys that we had uh, studied cannot do this type of coupling, right? Ullmann or Wurtz coupling. However, palladium gold is a nice exception. It is active for this type of coupling, and we wanted to study the mechanism a bit uh, more in detail. So this is the structure of uh, palladium gold. All the surface science experiments were done at uh, the lab of uh, Charlie Sykes, my collaborator in Tufts in Boston. So you can see in this image that we have these kind of strange elbow looking patterns. These are the herringbone reconstruction patterns on gold. Um, and the single atoms, you can see as uh, these protrusions here. So these are single atoms of palladium in which the coupling can happen. So um, this is the, the schematic that shows the, how the coupling proceeds. So uh, in the surface science experiment, you start with methyl iodide. You have uh, the CI bond readily cleaved on the surface, and then you end up with some iodides which at this point, we assume that they're just bystanders, not doing anything um, other than blocking some sites on the surface, of course. And then you can have these CD3 units that can couple over the palladium sites and giving, uh, giving you deuterated ethane on the, surface, on the gas phase. So some TPDs are shown here. You can see that gold, right? So we measure the signal of uh, deuterated ethane here. So gold is inactive for this transition for this uh, reaction. Um, palladium gold is this material here. We see a deuterated ethane peak at around 250 Kelvin. Uh, 
And then if we, all right, so this is the same lapum, we have very low coverages, it's about 3% monolayer. If we increase the amount of palladium that we dope the gold with, we see that again, we lose the activity. All right, so we see no peak for uh, the couple product for 0.1 molar of palladium or 0.9 molar of palladium on gold. And this was attributed to uh, coating essentially. So you over, uh, so you over couple and you also do some dehydrogenation and in the end you just block all these active sites so you don't see any couple product coming up to the uh, gas space. So this was uh, quite interesting and we started doing some uh, DFT calculations using BAS to try to understand the uh, mechanism of this process. And it turns out that, um, well, of course, if you do the coupling on gold, you have a very high barrier of about 1.5 EVs, right? So this already is in good agreement with experiments. And by the way, all of these calculations were done uh, by Roman Rocre, a postdoc in my lab. Now, if you wanted to do this on single atom alloys, you see that methyls, prefer to sit on palladium sites, which are far away from each other. This is a single atom alloy. So uh, it turns out that methyl will have to spill over to the gold surface first and then couple, right? That's the interface between palladium and gold. And there is an energy penalty associated with that spillover because methyl binds less strongly on gold than palladium. So here's what I'm showing here. Star means something bound on the dopant. Without the star, it's on the gold. So the more stable configuration is the two methyls on gold, right? This configuration has this energy here. Then you have a higher energy configuration, which corresponds to that. So minus 0.16 EVs, methyl on palladium and methyl on, on gold. And then from there, the reaction can proceed with about one EV barrier which doesn't look quite in agreement with experiments, we would expect the barrier to be lower. Indeed, when we do the temperature program desorption simulation using kinetic Monte Carlo, right? These simulations were done with Zucker. We see peaks, and I'm going to explain in a moment what the sigma is, but we see peaks at very high temperatures, much higher than the 250 Kelvin of the experiment. So this sigma is basically the ratio between methyls that we have on the surface divided by number of palladium atoms, right? Palladium size that we have. So sigma 0.7 means that 70% of palladiums are covered with methyl. And of course we need to pay the penalty, right? To uh, go onto the gold, et cetera. But then if you have sigma equals two, this means that you have twice the amount of methyls versus the number of palladium sites. So there are already existing methyls on the surface that can readily couple. But even in that case, right? The, the difference between these two states is quite small. So we do see a secondary peak. We can see better for sigma equals three. And we have a secondary peak there that corresponds to the coupling by this configuration. And then this shoulder, which corresponds to the coupling from methyl methyl on the palladium side. So the conclusion from these TPDs was that uh, this um, peak that we see in the experiment cannot be explained by this mechanism on the flat one, one, one surface of gold doped with palladium. So then we started thinking, well, the, the surface scientists say that yeah, they have an one, one, one surface, but in reality, we know that there is this uh, surface uh, reconstruction, the herringbone reconstruction. So we might want to try low coordinated sites to see if the barriers that we compute there and the TPDs might agree with experiments. And this is what we did. So this now is the same uh, sort of plot as previously, but for the 211 surface, which, uh, um, right, so the palladium atom on the step edge, the coordination number of that is slightly lower than uh, the one on the herringbone reconstruction. But for practical purposes, we went ahead with this model to try to see what, uh, what happens. And if we can indeed predict TPDs that are in better agreement with experiment. So we can already see that we have a much lower barrier for the coupling. Right, so this is uh, 0 0.23 above that, uh, above the zero level. Um, so then if we do the TPD for different coverages, we see that um, we can get a peak, right? For low coverages, 70% and 100% methyls on palladium, we can get a TPD peak that is about at around 250 Kelvin. If we go to higher coverages, we get, uh, we have readily available methyls that can couple 
right, with the methyl that is sitting on copper. When I say readily available, I mean they're already on the gold phase. And we see this secondary peak over here at a much lower temperature, right, around 170 or 200 Kelvin. This is not seen in experiments because they don't have, they don't operate at that high coverage of uh, methyl. So when we saw these results, we said, okay, that's good enough. And we conclude that low coordinated palladium atoms are indeed responsible for the coupling. So we published this in uh, Chemcom, right? Chemical Communications back in 2019. And then we thought, okay, case closed. Let's move on and try to look into another single atom alloy, nickel gold, and try to use the same ideas so that uh, uh, we can do the coupling with potentially cheaper single atom alloy, right? Nickel is cheaper than palladium here. So experimental data on that look uh, quite similar with palladium gold, right? Again, so here's the uh, STM image. You see the heavy body construction. These dots are the nickels. And if you look into the uh, TPD, you can see the deuterated ethane peak at 253 Kelvin, which is very close to the palladium gold case, 250. You can also see some byproducts, right? So you can see deuterated methane because there is a bit of uh, CHCD in this case activation. And there is also some hydrogen in the chamber, background hydrogen that can couple with the methane groups and give you this. Uh, so for our purposes, we focus on this, uh, uh, this product. And we try to do uh, the, uh, to analyze the pathways, the energy pathways of the reaction and try to see if we can simulate again the uh, TPDs um, for this uh, single atom alloy, nickel gold. So these are the results that we saw previously for palladium gold with a low coordinated site. And these are the new results on nickel gold. Again, we focused on the low coordinated site. And we see in this case that we have a more, a, a better stabilization of these methyl groups on nickel. And we have a slightly different profile here, right? So we see that the difference in these energies, right? Methyl, methyl on the dopants versus methyl on the dopant and methyl on the gold. This energy is higher. This energy difference is higher on nickel than the palladium side. Uh, conversely, the difference between the transition state energy and this higher energy state is lower here on nickel gold than on palladium gold. So on this table, I have summarized the, the barriers that we see. If we start from methyl on gold and methyl on palladium, we see a barrier of 0.45 EVs on palladium gold, but a lower barrier of 0.36 on nickel gold. If we start with the most stable state, methyls on the dopant, we have the opposite ordering. So we have a 0.67, right? Lower um, activation energy for palladium gold versus nickel gold, which is quite interesting. So, right, the barriers are quite different, but we have the same experimental desorption peak. So for uh, low coverage, of course, it's this barrier that uh, matters. When we try to do the TPD, we indeed found the uh, variance, right? The discrepancy between experiments. So here is the TPD on palladium gold. I just picked, right? These are results that we saw before, but I picked only um, the, uh, the spectra for 100% coverage. This initial state here, every palladium covered by methyl, and then 200% coverage, this state here, in which we have as many methyls on the gold sites as methyls on the uh, palladium sites. If we do, right, so if we try to assign these peaks, of course, this will be uh, for the, uh, the higher barrier, 0.67, sorry, the, the, low, the higher barrier, yeah. And for the lower barrier here, 0.45, we have this peak here that manifests only at the higher uh, coverage. If we go to the case of nickel gold, right, we saw that this higher barrier is 0.77 electron volts, coupling from methyl, methyl on the dopant. And then we have a lower barrier, lower than the case of palladium, right? 0.36 in this case um, for coupling between the two methyls on gold and palladium. So this is quite interesting, right? Because this is at high variance with experiments. This is 300, this was 250. So then we started scratching our heads, to try to um, come up with an idea of what might be happening. 
So you might have noticed that in all of these discussions, I have assumed that iodine is just a bystander. This is not necessarily the case. So next we started investigating the role of iodine. So try to investigate the spillover of iodine from the stable side to the gold. Uh, again, these are results that we saw before, methyl spilling over to the uh, gold. This is a difficult process, an endothermic process. Now, if iodine goes, um, all right, so if iodine goes from the gold to the, uh, to the palladium site or the nickel site, this is exothermic. So essentially the uh, dopant sites stabilize iodine atoms and they stabilize them more than they stabilize the uh, methyl groups. So this is bad news for our reactivity because this means that the active site would be blocked by iodine, right? When we try to do the coupling, so the activity would decrease. But on the other hand, if we take the sum of these two processes and try to do a swap between methyls and iodines, we see that this swap, right, is exothermic. The swap is methyl on dopant jumping over to gold, iodine from gold coming over here. So this uh, endothermicity for methyl to go on to the uh, gold, which is necessary for the coupling, is kind of compensated by the iodine jumping over from the gold phase onto the dopant. So this is the opposite effect, right? This would promote the activity because of this endothermic method spillover being compensated by the spillover of iodine in the opposite direction. So at this point, we can no longer say um, what is, we can no longer tell what is going to happen by just looking at the FT numbers. We really need kinetic Monte Carlo simulation in order to take into account all of these processes in addition to the coupling. So this is what we did, and uh, the results here are in much better agreement with, uh, uh, with experiments. So this, um, right, these are the results that we saw before. In addition to this pink curve, which corresponds to this initial state, iodine sitting on the uh, dopants, and then methyl groups, as many as the iodine groups. This is again in agreement with experiment because you have methyl iodide. You have an equal number of methyls and iodides here in the surface. And when we do the TPD, we see a um, peak of around 235 Kelvin for palladium gold and about 260 for nickel gold. So the uh, discrepancies between the experiment are on the order of 10 to 15 Kelvin. So I can claim that uh, the, the discrepancy is because of DFT error or not exactly because of the, because of the uh, slightly different coordination number of the 211 site versus the uh, low coordinated site in the Herringbone reconstruction. But the bottom line is that we have a close agreement with experiments and the mechanism is similar to ligand reactant exchange in homogeneous catalysis. It's quite interesting as well, because uh, it shows that these single atom catalysts sometimes behave in a similar way as uh, a homogeneous catalysts. Okay, so moving on to the uh, second part of the, um, this uh, case studies, just briefly, I wanted to highlight the surface aggregation effects on highly dilute alloys. So we saw that single atom alloys are quite nice because they have these unique properties, but then there are some reactions that cannot happen in single atom alloys. Here are two examples with references, ethane dehydrogenation on palladium gold, diphenyl acetylene hydrogenation on palladium uh, silver. Um, so the motivation is to study larger ensembles, so potentially dimers, trimers, or bigger islands that can do these types of, these types of uh, reactions. And from a calculation standpoint, what we care about is trying to predict the ensemble under reaction conditions. So we wanted to start simple. Um, and what I'm going to show you is uh, a set of calculations that focus on the effect of CO, reversible absorption of CO, um, and trying to predict the ensemble, right? The population of monomers, dimers, trimers, and bigger islands as a function of CO, coverage and temperature. So these calculations were done um, by my former PhD student, Kostas Papanikolaou. They're quite elaborate calculations. Uh, I'm just summarizing some of uh, the, the essence here. So here is the lattice. We take into account these three types of sites. The elementary events are CO, absorption, desorption, and diffusion. We take into account explicitly dynamics for these, but we also have dopant host atom swaps, right? So gold nickel swapping so that we have some mobility on the surface. At this level, we only take into account thermodynamics, right? The kinetics are uh, quite, uh, they're more difficult to capture. So we were only focusing on the thermodynamics of the surface structure. 
and we uh, took into account the lateral interactions between metals and CO bound, uh, CO covered uh, metal atoms using a cluster expansion approach. So we fitted several cluster expansions for uh, several alloy systems, and we simulated the uh, ensemble as a function of partial pressure of CO. So what I'm showing here is, first of all, the CO dopant fractional coverage, how many, right, the percentage of dopants that are covered by CO, 100% means all of them covered by CO, um, uh, as a function of normalized partial pressure of uh, CO. And I'm also showing with these plots here, these graphs, I'm showing the number of, or the percentage of uh, dimers, trimers, monomers, and bigger islands that I have on the surface. So we saw three out of the uh, six single atom alloys that we focused on, we saw three patterns of behavior. The first one, which was probably the most interesting one, was this set of transitions from monomers to dimers and trimers. You see this hump here corresponds to dimers, trimers, and islands on the surface at intermediate partial pressures of CO, and then back to monomers at much higher partial pressures of CO. So these are the transitions that may happen on palladium gold or nickel, copper, and palladium silver. The second pattern of behavior was when we have um, uh, breaking of aggregates. So at very low partial pressures of CO, we have um, uh, mostly islands that are broken into single, uh, single atoms, right, monomer, that are covered by CO. So these are the islands. I have 100% islands at low cover low coverage and partial pressures of CO. And then I go through a transition in which I get the monomers. So this was the case of iridium silver, for example. And finally, there were some single atom alloys that always prefer the single atom alloy configuration. So these were uh, alloys like rod and copper. You see, we have monomers at 100% throughout. And of course, when you increase the partial pressure of CO, the only thing you do is just uh, populate these, uh, cover these with uh, CO as well. So rhodium copper and platinum copper were in that category where they generally preferred single atom alloys. The single atom alloy phase. Now, these are with respect to partial pressure of CO. We can also do the calculations for a fixed partial pressure of CO, but uh, changing the temperature. And these are results that are shown here for the case of uh, palladium gold. So we see that uh, for that fixed partial pressure of CO, when we increase the temperature, we increase the, um, the population of clusters that we have, dimers, trimers, and, and bigger ensembles, right? Where, whereas we decrease the number of monomers we have. And this is quite nice because it has been confirmed by experiments. So what I'm showing here briefly is in situ IR experiments. So these two uh, frequencies correspond to gas CO. This one corresponds to eight bound CO, but then we also have this broad feature that corresponds to CO bound to bridge and FCC side. What I'm not showing here is that this uh, uh, change is reversible. So that when they were doing experiments, right, when they were changing the temperature, going back to 30 degrees Celsius, this feature was disappearing. So um, this is a direct experimental observation of CO and dimers and trimers. And the practical importance of that is that it changes the selectivity of reactions like ethanol uh, dehydrogenation to acetaldehyde and hydrogen. Right, so this is motivated by things like converting biomass to right biomass derived ethanol to useful chemical products like aldehydes. So the uh, the reaction is happening quite selectively in the single atom alloy phase. There is this reversible transition to the more dense kind of uh, ensembles in which ethanol can still get dehydrogenated but non selectively. So you get a bunch of products including carbon monoxide, methane, and ethyl acetate. All right, so depending on what type of products you want, you may want to try to engineer the catalytic surface at this configuration or the, the other one. Um, uh, again, of course, depending on the application. So more details of that can be found in our publication and major communication. So this uh, shows, uh, hopefully showcases some uh, studies in which we um, uh, use kinetic Monte Carlo to try to understand and unravel the complexity that we have in catalytic materials. Um, and ongoing work in my lab is focusing on trying to go up the scales, right, mesh and macro scales, to try to simulate even more complex phenomena like dynamic other extraction. So 
I mentioned earlier these uh, famous results by Ertl and co workers. Right? These are the spirals in the CO oxidation reaction on the 100 platinum surface that are attributed to reconstruction. So, if you were to do these with traditional serial kinetic Monte Carlo algorithms, this would be impossible. You would have to simulate extremely large lattices. Right? Each one of these arms of the spiral has a length of hundreds of atomic diameters. So, you could parallelize the simulation, and there are two kinds of paradigms, two types of parallelization, shared memory and distributed. Shared memory is still not adequate for these kinds of very large simulations, so we need to go with distributed KMC. So in one slide, I just wanted to explain the challenge that we had to face. This is, uh, right, so this is the paper that we published uh, a couple of years ago. It took several years of work to get to that stage because the um, this distributed kinetic Monte Carlo simulation requires algorithms that overcome uh, causality violations of the boundaries, and this is uh, quite uh, uh, non-trivial to do. Right, there is quite a lot of bookkeeping and algorithmic challenge. So essentially, what we do is we have a large domain. Obviously, this is just an example. Imagine millions of sites, right? So this is just for illustration purposes. So we have nine subdomains here. Each one of them is assigned to a processor. Each processor simulates events asynchronously if these events are happening at the interior of their domain. But when things happen at the boundaries, right, there is the scale region. When this, uh, these events happen at the boundaries, you have to communicate your events to the neighboring processor. And this is where problems start because it turns out that by the nature of the kinetic Monte Carlo simulation, each one of these processors has its own kinetic Monte Carlo clock. So when, let's say I'm processor four, I send something to processor seven, right? The particle by diffusion at 10 milliseconds, processor seven may already be at 15 milliseconds. This means that the history from 10 to 15 is wrong. It will have to be re-simulated. So seven goes back to 10 milliseconds, gets my particle, deletes the history. But when it deletes the history, there may have been some events that affected the state of other processor. So then it will have, right, seven will have to tell eight, for example, that uh, eight will have to undo an action that was communicated by seven to them, right? So then this may lead to another rollback and subsequent rollbacks and resimulations. So it turns out that one causality violation at one boundary may lead to a cascade of rollbacks and resimulation, which makes it horrendously complicated to deal with. Fortunately, there, there, is, uh, there are some ideas from computer science that we use, the so-called time of algorithm, that allow us, allows us to uh, resolve exactly these causality violations and get a self-consistent simulation at the global level. More details on that, I'm happy to elaborate if you're interested, but of course I'm running out of time. You can also read that paper. I just wanted to uh, show you what we can do with it. So this is the biggest, the largest kinetic Monte Carlo simulation I've ever run. It's uh, on 16 million sites. And the purpose of that was to demonstrate that we can uh, capture spatial temporal complexity using this time work implementation. So what you're about to see is a prototype reaction network that is simulated on a lattice with 60, 60 million sites. It's called the Brasilator. This was developed by Ilya Prigozhin and co-workers back in the, I believe, 90s, um, where people were interested in complexity and phase transitions, etc. So this is an adaptation of this model on the lattice. And I have seeded the particles these are two species, X and Y. I have seeded their particles in such a way that I create a broken front that is going to curl around itself and create these spiral waves that take over the domain. So this, right, the, this simulation captures about 1.5 trillion events. It took me about 38 days to simulate with 625 processors. If I was to do this with a serial simulation, it would have taken over one and a half years. All right, so this is um, essentially showing that we are making simulations that were intractable five years ago. We now have the tools to uh, um, get to this level of complexity and do these simulations in an efficient way. Uh, and of course, we have several other papers, right? So previously I uh, showed you the reference for the method development paper, but we have a couple more that benchmark the approach and uh, we have ongoing work that tries to make these algorithms uh, more efficient. So to conclude, I, I hope that I have shown some um, uh, overview of our work that tries to 
develop approaches, kinetic modeling approaches that integrate several core sources of complexity and allow us to understand and predict catalytic kinetics of uh, complex systems. And of course, ongoing work um, is focusing on massively parallel distributed simulations. Hopefully, one day we will be able to uh, do simulations on billions of sites to try to uh, understand better things like reconstruction, pattern formation, spatial temporal uh, complexity on satellite surface. With that, I would like to acknowledge my group, right, and collaborators, funding sources and computational resources, and open the floor to questions.